à cause du sommeil et à cause des chats. Cause du sommeil. sight of her, she was knitting in a low chair against the sunlight on the wall, and something at once made me see her as a great tabby cat, dozing yet awake, heavily sleepy, and yet at the same time prepared for instantaneous action. Very soft, yet very active she was, for all her size and mass, and I felt she knew what I was doing even after I had passed and was behind her back. When she speaks to me, her voice is smooth and running. As I sit lazily melting into dream, a sound of horns and strings and wood instruments rises to my ears to the accompaniment of a very soft, deep-throated drum. The music floating up through the trees is wholly charming, though I recognize nothing. It sounds as though they are simply improvising without a conductor. No definitely marked time runs through the pieces which end and begin oddly after the flashing of the wind through an Aeolian arm. Makes me think of trees swept by the wind, of night breezes singing among wires and chimney stacks, or in the rigging of invisible ships, or a chorus of animals, of wild creatures somewhere in desolate places of the world, crying and singing as animals will to the moon. In the nights, I can hear the wailing, half-human cries of cats upon the tiles, rising and falling with weird intervals of sound, muffled by distance and trees.
dusk is running down the twisted streets. All around the hill, the plain presses in like a dim sea, its level rising with the darkness. Everybody's watching me closely. Every movement I make is known and observed. Ignoring me was all an elaborate pretense. The real activities and interests of these people are elsewhere and otherwise than they appear. Their true lives lie somewhere out of sight, behind the scenes. Their busyness is but the outward semblance that masks their actual purposes. They buy and sell, eat and drink, walk about the streets, Yet all the while, the mainstream of their existence lies somewhere beyond my ken, underground, in secret places. My old world reality has receded. Here, whether I like it or no, is something new and incomprehensible. I dream of cats and soft-moving creatures, and the silence of life in a dim, muffled world beyond the senses. These people do nothing directly. They behave obliquely, looking at me from angles which naturally should lead their sight in another direction altogether. Their movements concerning me are oblique too. The straight, direct thing is not their way, evidently. They do nothing, obviously. Out of the mist that slowly gathered about my ordinary surface thoughts, there arose the idea that the inhabitants are waiting for me to declare myself, to take an attitude, to do this or to do that, and that when I do so, they, in their turn, will at length make some direct response, accepting or rejecting me. Yet, the vital matter concerning which my decision was awaited comes no nearer to me. These people are people of the twilight. They live only at night their real life, and come out honestly only with the dusk. During the day, they make a sham, though brave pretense, and after the sun is down, their true life begins. They have the souls of night things. She, Ilse, has the silken movements of the panther, going smoothly and silently to and fro, and the same indirect, oblique methods as the rest, screening like them secret purposes of her own, purposes that I am sure have me for their objective. She keeps me, to my terror and delight, ceaselessly under observation, yet so carelessly, so constantly, that I hardly notice it at all. She often contrives to interject little odd sentences that I never properly understand, yet feel to be significant.
it is these stray remarks, full of a meaning that evaded me, that point to some hidden purpose of our own and make me feel uneasy. And has Monsieur not even yet come to a decision? She had said softly in my ear, sitting beside me in the sunny yard. Her voice, her closeness, and her soft, dark dress. So then we went over the town together, and she showed me what she considered its chief interest. The tumble-down old house where her forebears had lived. The somber, aristocratic-looking mansion where her mother's family dwelt for centuries. And the ancient marketplace where several hundred years before, the witches had been burned by the score. If you like me, she had said, you must also like what I do and what I belong to. You will take part in our real life. I mean, that you will come back to us. I saw her then, as if moving through smoke and flame amid broken and tempestuous scenery, alarmingly strong, a terrible mother by her side. Dimly this shone through her smile, an appearance of charming innocence. The real life I speak of, she had whispered, is the old, old life within. The life of long ago, the life to which you, too, once belonged, and to which you still belong. It is their thoughts constantly playing about your soul that makes you feel they watch you. They do not watch you with their eyes. The purposes of their inner life are calling to you, seeking to claim you. You were all part of the same life long ago, and now they want you back again among them. You, dear soul of my dim past, here she had pressed closer to me so that her breath passed across my eyes and her voice positively sang. I mean to have you, for you love me, and are utterly at my mercy. The terror of it all, the dreadful thought of death, pressed ever behind her sentences, for flame shot through her voice out of black smoke and licked at my soul. She had arisen and moved yet closer, looking at me with a certain insolence. The insolence of power.
is set behind the towers of the old cathedral, and the darkness rises up from the plain and envelops them. The music has ceased. The leaves of the plane trees hang motionless, the chill of the autumn evening enfolding you. As once before I see it, tall and stately, moving through wild and broken scenery of forests and mountain caverns, the glare of flames behind her head and clouds of shifting smoke about her feet. Dark leaves encircle her hair, flying loosely in the wind, and her limbs shine through the merest rags of clothing. Others are about her too, and ardent eyes on all sides cast delirious glances upon her. But her own eyes are always for one only, one whom she holds by the hand. For she was leading the dance in some tempestuous orgy to the music of chanting voices, and the dance she led circled about a great and awful figure on a throne brooding over the scene through lurid vapours, while innumerable other wild faces and forms crowded furiously about her in the dance. But the one she held by the hand, I knew to be myself. And the monstrous shape upon the throne, I knew to be her mother. The memory of her soul, how the moon caress comes back to me with a shudder. Lapse of centuries, caught, caught. and quaint old towers lie far away in its purple reaches. The cathedral appears unreal in a silver mist. The streets are all deserted and very silent. The doors are closed, the shutters fastened, not a soul is a stone. The hush of night lies over everything. It is like a town of the dead, a churchyard with gigantic and grotesque tombstones. A large, dark thing. thought it an immense cat, distorted in some way by the play of light and shadow. Then it 
rises straight up before me, I recognize the proprietress, a terrible dignity clothing her. Huge and sinister, she stands there, and I feel the stirring of awe and the roots of some ancient fear. I bow. Enfant, monsieur, c'est donc décidé, c'est bien vrai. J'en suis contente. On pourrait faire un petit tour ensemble, n'est-ce pas? Nous y allons cette nuit et il faut se saucer un peu d'avance pour cela. Il se, il se, viens donc ici, bien vite! The air seems to thicken like smoke, shot through with a red glare as a flame. I'm aware that the hand the mother had released is now tightly held by the daughter. Ilsa has leaves of vervain twined in her dark hair and is clothed in tattered vestiges of some curious garment, beautiful as the night, and horribly, odiously, loathsomely seductive. There is a hum and murmur of a great activity from the streets beyond, the sound of footsteps and voices muffled by distance. It's clear and strong there, and I see the outlines of dark bodies moving with long footsteps. They pass swiftly and silently, shaped like immense cats, in an endless procession, and then appear to leap down to a lower level. I just catch the soft thudding of their leaps. Sometimes their shadows fall on the white wall opposite, and I can no longer make out whether they are the shadows of human beings or of cats. Fierce and sweet, furiously assail me, and my blood stirs horribly as I seem to hear the call of the dance. Suddenly, a great lion's cat leapt softly from the shadows and stared fixedly with human eyes. Come, it seemed to say, come with us to the dance. Change is of old. Transform yourself swiftly and come. The passion of it rose within me like a flood, twisting in my entrails, sending my heart's desire flaming forth into the night for the old, old dance of the sorceress at the witch's summit. Then the whirl of the stars was about me, the magic of the moon, the power of the wind rushing from precipice and forest, leaping from cliff to cliff across the valleys to form a little way. I could hear the cries of the dancers and their wild laughter as with this savage girl in my embrace I danced furiously about the dim throne where sat the figure with the sect.
turn and gaze out over the great plain like a silver map of some dream country. No air stirs. The leaves of the plane tree stand motionless. The near details are defined with the sharpness of day against dark shadows, and in the distance the fields and woods melt away into haze and shimmery mistiness. Then I look into the depth of the valley below. The whole lower slopes of the hill that lie hid from the brightness of the moon or aglow. Through the glare I see countless moving forms, shifting thick and fast between the openings of the trees, while overhead, like leaves driven by the wind, I discern flying shapes that hover darkly one moment against the sky, and then settle down with cries and weird singing through the branches into the regions of flame. I turn back to the girl. Some dark substance stains her face and skin shining in the moonlight. She stretches her hands towards me, dressed in wretched, tattered garments that yet become her mightily. Ruined the vein twine about her temples, her eyes glitter with unholy light. Rub well your skin before you fly. Come, come with me to the sabbat, to the madness of his furious delight, to the sweet abandonment of worship. See, the great ones are there and the terrible sacraments prepared. The throne is occupied. Anoint and come, anoint and come. Come with your dear apostate soul and we will worship and dance till the moon dies. The world has forgotten. And I see them all. Perched there in a row like cats upon the roof, all dark and singularly shapeless, their eyes like lamps. And a sudden memory comes back to me of Ilsa's terror at the sight of fire. I strike a match and throw it into the dead leaves that lay under the wall. Dry and withered, they catch fire at once, and the wind carries the flame in a long line down the length of the wall. Licking upwards as it runs, and with shrieks and wailings, the crowded row of forms melt away into the air on the other side, and are gone with a great rush and a whirring of their bodies down into the heart of the haunted man. I turn back towards the town, and slowly make my way in the direction of the hotel. And as I go, a great wailing of cries and a sound of howling follow me from the gleaming forest below me, growing fainter and fainter with the bursts of wind as I disappear.